Hi everybody, hope you're doing marvellously well. I'm sitting here with Francis Buckley, how are you? Very good, thank you. This is quite fun, we are in uh, MI, Musicians Institute, mm-hmm. in Hollywood. In the heart of Hollywood. What is your official job here? Um, I am an uh, audio engineering instructor, and right. I teach the, um, the advanced console operation and advanced um, signal processing. Great, and I had so, a, a good gander at your resume, which is quite vast. Yeah, I've been around for a while. Uh, you're not 22 anymore? No, I used to have dark hair. Oh. <laughs> I, I actually only have dark hair because of hair dye. Ah, yes. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, mm-hmm. talking of your resume, um, obviously there's some great stuff with Quincy Jones. Mm-hmm. But before Quincy Jones, you engineered for Glenn Ballard. Yes, Glenn and I were, we had a partnership for, lasted about 14 years. Um, in 1981, I became chief engineer at MCA Music Publishing. And Glenn was one of the top writers there. In fact, he's the guy that kind of, they said, go down in the studio with Francis and record something and, and see how it goes. So he and I went down and we did a, a really cool version of um, Baby Please Don't Go. Baby Please Don't Go down to New Orleans. And he did this whole thing. Mm-hmm. And he was like, yeah, he's doing a great job. So I came in and in 1981, I was there from 81 to 91. And in that 10 years was the transition from the producer being kind of the record company guy on the phone. Yeah, it sounds great. I'll, I'll get back to you. And the writer in the back of the room going, that's not how I intended my song to go. Sure. In that 10 years, the writer became the producer. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so I was working with all the top LA writers. So these guys were going out to do records and saying, hey, come with us. So that's kind of how I sort of fell into this this business. Fantastic. Yeah, it was through that. Yeah, it was it was awesome. You know, this is one of the songs that I can really feel Glenn's influence on the lyric. Oh, you can? Yeah, there's a lot of stuff in the lyric. Just the fact that nothing in the lyric is ironic. It's all coincident. Right. There's right. nothing ironic about it. And that sure. to me is the ultimate Right. In the irony of it. Sure. <laughs> the yeah. song is ironic, but, you know, like Mr. Duplicity, that's, right. that's Glenn. That's, you know, because he was a great lyric writer. Oh, great no, it's amazing. Writer, you know, yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. Mm-hmm. I mean, Man in the Mirror is still one of my favorite songs. Yeah. I um, was lucky enough to... And this is an incredible song. I sat in the room with, with Glenn and Saida when they wrote that song. I, I have the original demo on that. The only difference between the original demo and the record is the record starts with that do da do da that little mm-hmm. bell thing, and then at the end it does the big mod modulation mm-hmm. change. Um, that's the only difference between the demo and the record. That little intro thing and the modulation. Other than sure. that, boom, it's the song exactly the way it is, and that song just sprang to life as soon as they hit on the title. Well, they were talking about. You know, writing from for, for for Michael. You know, big theme. What's the biggest theme of all? Change the world. Right? Yeah. And they finally, it's once I, I don't know whether it was Glenn or Saidi that said, "What about Man in the Mirror?" And it was like dictation from you know the way I recall it. I think about forty five minutes later, that song existed. Amazing. Know? Yeah, I've always been. I mean, my time in music publishing has taught me that great songs already exist, and you sure. just become the conduit <laughs> right. to it. You know, because most the great songs that have been around that people have written, there's been no rewrite, there's been no, mm-hmm. you know, f- f- pain over the lyric or whatever, they just... You mean there wasn't seven people in the room, one guy <laughs> had a beat, the other guy had a hook thing, <laughs> yeah. and then this person there... I programmed the kick, yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> you sure? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So these are the final elements, what, what, right. what are yeah. from the... Uh, um, now, I'm not sure this... I'm. Trying to, this might be Matt Log. I'm trying to remember who the drummers were. Matt was one of them. I think, um, who's the other guy? Went on to be a, a good sweet drummer. Was it wasn't, wasn't um, Kurt Piscara. But I know Matt Log was one of them. And I think I love Kurt Piscara. Yeah, Kurt's, he's a MI grad. Well, but, um, you know, you can hear this. This is, this is not a big drum machine, but there is a loop in here. Right. Right, but there is somebody playing the brushes, so I don't know how all of this is all combined on down here in the stems. Yeah, are they got it panned left and right now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Panned off left and right, yeah. Yeah, so they're combining loop, loop elements and live drums. Yeah. There's something about the steady, unrelenting thing of the loop and right. a drummer going, hey, bra ba 
yeah. like that. Yeah. You know, playing a fill over the top of it. But then your drummer's got to really be locked to that loop. Sure. You got to have. And a lot of times, in these in this day, these would have been actual audio loops. These would not have been MIDI loops. Sure. So whatever the tempo or whatever the sloppiness of the drummer in the loop. You had to go with it because there was no fixing it, <laughs> yeah. you know? I mean, you know, all those old loops that were just taken off old sure. Motown records and stuff, you know? I don't know whether this is... This might... This might have been the, 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 the one that they tried to sue over the sound uh, because okay. they were said it was the sound taken from somebody else's record, a keyboard sound, and it turned out that it was a preset in a Korg keyboard that Glenn had so they had to go after Korg to find out where the sample came uh, from. But I remember Glenn going, I didn't send anybody samples off anything. It was off my keyboard. Yeah. You know, yeah. But this might have been, you know. So this is a loop with a real drummer, okay? The bass. This is Flea. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Originally. Who was the original? Well, it might have been, I'm trying to think of the bass players we used. It might have been Davey Farragher. Oh, I love that. Or Tommy. Who was the bass player? Tommy, Tommy key player. Keyboard, ba right. Davey played bass. Um, or, um, I'm trying to think who the other bass. There was a girl named Jennifer Kondo that used to play with Mark Goldenberg, but I don't think it was her. But I'm pretty sure that the electric guitars would have been um, Basil Fung. But I don't think, none of the, none of the touring musicians are on the record. Right. This right. is pre probably putting the yeah, band before together. The, before the, before yeah. she went on a tour the first time. So you can see the simplicity of this track. It's, uh, you know, are these really even guitar parts? They're amazing. You know? yeah, and it's like, and really, you know, that's, you know, and then her singing. And just a vocal and a double. This wasn't one of those songs that called for background vocals. Because this is just really like, I am in your face and I ain't leaving. Tremolo in there as well. Oh, yeah. And that would have been all coming out of the amplifier. This would have been pre plug in days. This would have been back in the days when plugins we actually plugged in. <laughs> it's distorted. Distorted yeah. hit really yeah. hard with that yeah. right hand. Yeah. Let's, yeah. Uh, let's go back to the top again. Mm -hmm. yeah, just... I want you to know that I'm here. But we weren't, we weren't really loud she monitors. Like me. Would she go, she go on you in a theater? I know this isn't Glenn play. Glenn played bass, but I know this isn't him. This is too funky. Yeah, this is definitely Flea. Yeah. This whole record was happening during the transition when Glenn was finally getting his studio at home and he could start doing more sure. work at home. And I found myself more at his home than I was right. at MCA. So uh, there was, and we were doing, you know, a, a, there were different projects going on, you know. So it's like sometimes it's like, uh, you know, there are times when I thought, oh, yeah, we did that. And they're going, no, 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 that was on that record. It's like, oh, I knew we did it. I just yeah. couldn't remember what record it was we yeah. did it on, you know, because we were, Glenn was, he liked to, he liked to be on the bleeding edge of stuff, right. you know, um, and we had a, we had, we had a cool sort of division of labor. He went out and, and, and brought in all the gigs and I went to all the manufacturers and brought in all the gear. Right. And we had, I mean, I had people throwing stuff at me <laughs> sure. in those days, you know, yeah. it was kind of like, here, take one of these, take one of these, take one of these. You Great. Know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, the only thing in all of this transition from tape to ADAT to, to Pro Tools, one of the things that it really taught me is I, I used to bring my ADATs because they were mine and I knew how they were and I brought them into the studio and we used them all the time. And then we did a string date at uh, East West, right? And the way we had it set up was the first machine was the slave and it had all the information and the other four, those were our 24 tracks that we're going to record all the strings, right? So 
where everything is working along and, and I'm noticing something on the BRC and I'm going, what the, and I look over and one of the machines has dropped off and it's like, and I'm trying to get it, you know, I got an orchestra out here, man. I'm trying to get this thing to work. Well, I always kept two or more in my car. So I told my assistant, run out to my car and get one of those. While you're out, I'm going to pull this out. We pull it out, we swap the other one in and we get back to work, right? And it occurred to me, this is a recording studio. What is the central piece in the recording studio? The recorder. Mm -hmm. If the recorder doesn't work and the session goes down, who's going to eat the session? The guy that owns the recorder. Right. That was the last day I brought any of my own recording systems into a studio. Chill. Yeah. No, no, you rent those things and make the rental company eat the session. I'm not right. I'm not eating it. Right. No, that was like <laughs> That's it. It's the last time I will ever bring these things in. <laughs> right. You know, um, I'm also one of the guys that pushed studio managers into providing me with the Pro Tools rig because I was at Westlake and I went to, to the studio manager and he said, I, I want a reduction on the room. Why? Well, because I'm not using your tape machine. I'm using my rig. Well, you're still using my recording studio. Yeah, recording studio without a tape machine. You know what we call that? A rehearsal room. Right. And I'm not paying recording studio prices for a rehearsal room. He said, well, what do you need? I said, well, rent me a Pro Tools rig. Okay. And then, uh, then I started seeing, you know, suddenly st studio managers were including it. Because that was always something you had to rent. Remember, sure. you wanted to use the Sony 48. Studios didn't have them. You had to rent those things. Sure. So that, but that was, again, out of that thing. I'm not bringing, you know how often Pro Tools goes down? <laughs> I'm not, yeah. I'm not eating any time. You know, sure. that, was a, that was a big lesson. It was a very big, fortunately it wasn't a painful lesson. Right. <laughs> it could have hurt. I remember some of my first bigger gigs on records in the early 2000s, I was an editor. Right. So I was already producing and engineering and stuff, but if I wanted to get my name on a bigger record, I did three albums with Dave Sardi as a Pro okay. Tools yeah. editor. Yeah. And they would pay you to bring in your rig. So mm -hmm. that I'd, I'd, I'd rent my rig back and myself back at a day rate, yeah. and I would edit records. Yeah, I, I, I paid off my Pro Tools rig really quickly because yeah. there were I paid rentals. Off my first album. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's, but that's, rentals don't exist anymore, no. you know. Not like that. Not like that. I mean, when you're, you know, when, you, when you're up in the big leagues, you know, I mean, there's still, there are still traditional records being made, but not, not very many of them where you got a full budget, you're at Capitol right. for three months with a lockout. You know? Sure. Those were the days. Those and even days. those records that are made like that probably aren't recouping. They're just made at that yeah. level because that's the level that the artists work at. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're making an Elton John record, it's going to be made properly. Yeah, It's yeah. not going to be done, you know, mm -hmm. in somebody's home studio. Yeah, yeah. It's like, I, I think for myself, the last full old school record that I did where there was cartage and catering and no worries about in rentals and whatever I needed was Quincy's record in 96. Right. right. That's that's a couple of years ago. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm still getting them up until because like the fray and Aerosmith was seven years, eight years ago. Right. That was and I'm sure. But, but it's again, if Aerosmith yeah. do another album. Yeah. Well, OK, I they're going to they're do it at the level I they want take to do that it. Back. It was Aerosmith. It would have been the Nine Lives record that we started down in Florida. Oh, that OK. Was a full. I heard lots of stories about that from yes, Aerosmith. Yes. I'm sure you yes. have lots of stories as well. Oh, it was, we'll, was, we'll talk about more about those off camera. Yes. No, that was, <laughs> you know, that was an experience like when I did the Black Flag record. Okay. When I, right. that was the very first record I ever engineered. I had been in, working at the studio for three weeks. Chief engineer quit. I became chief engineer. Hey, Black Flag will be here at one o'clock to do their new record. Okay. Well, that was 1980. Okay. I was into, hard progressive rock or, mm -hmm. or acid jazz where you go to the, watch these guys play and you go, oh, I got to give up playing. These guys are so good. Yeah. And here I'm in the studio with these punks, right? Yeah. But right away. Was that with Keith singing? No, it was, uh, it was Henry Rollins' first well, So Henry, yeah, it was, it was his the, first the record he was in. Yeah. Yeah. And the first thing that, that struck me with these guys was their professionality. And they were total pros, mm -hmm. just total pros. And Aerosmith was the same thing, okay? The only place... And this is just because of where they are. The only thing that was that was interesting to me was they had, it looked like the freaking guitar hall at NAMM. They had, I counted sure. 100 guitars on stands, okay? Yeah. And an accompanying cabinet and head, right? So Joe and his, his tech, Archie, would go out to the studio and Joe would say, 
give me that guitar, that head, and that cabinet. Let's try that head. Now let's try that. And it would take them forever to get a guitar sound because he's got, let me try that guitar. And, and all the time in the world, you know. So that to me was the only, and I, don't, I wouldn't put that in with not being professional, but that was just kind of the indulgence wanting you get well, to what, that. What I actually, it's interesting because what I loved about Joe was the fact that he would never settle. So what we would do oh, yeah. is we'd get a guitar sound and we'd spend half a day getting this amazing guitar sound. Mm -hmm. And I remember we would have like a close mic amp, um, mic the room, then a small amp, close mic that, and then maybe put a DI through a pedal, you know, but yeah. just going through a mic pre, blend all the sounds together, get this incredible guitar sound. We'd do the pre-chorus and then he'd be going, okay, cool, let's do something else. And you'd be like, I just spent four or five hours and you do just the pre-chorus. Yeah, and then, yeah, and now you want to move on. You want to move on, but yeah. I, yeah. It was like the most, you know, the mo I had the most fun and most enjoyment yeah. because yeah. because we got to be indulge what we love, like yeah. getting sounds like yeah. a bit of EQs and compression, moving the microphones around, trying different pedals, yeah. you know, yeah. and even it, like yeah. learning about cables. I learned more about cables than anything else because I remember we had this huge long like hundred plus foot red guitar cable, right? right. And I was like, where's the top end going? And that's when I learned about, oh, actually high quality guitar cables make yes. a big difference. Yeah. And then suddenly you change out a, a, a mid-price you know, uh, guitar cable, put a high-end one in there, suddenly all the top end came suddenly, back. Suddenly, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, well. The, you, you have six strings on your guitar. Yeah. <laughs> and it's amazing, yeah. you know, because there's all those sort of debates about that stuff. Yeah. And you don't really know how important mm -hmm. things are until you're in a situation yeah. where there's hundreds of feet's worth of cable. I remember the first <laughs> time I got a demonstration of clean power. Right. Right. It was like I went, I really wish I hadn't have heard that. Right. Because now I got to go to my studio and get a power con conditioner sure. and a voltage regulator because right. I've heard it, you know. Yeah. And, you know, let's face it, uh, the power regulators, getting clean power into your studio is awesome, but it's not very sexy. No. Nobody comes into your studio and goes, wow, man, what a what a cool voltage regulator you got. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but what yeah. cool cables you got. But it's the cables. I I, I describe them as your, your blood vessels. Yeah. Your blood's going to travel through that. Yeah. You know, you're going to spend $1,000 on a microphone and five cents on the cable. Yeah. <laughs> but that's that's part of the education. I want to listen a bit more, Alanis. Yes. Let's listen a bit more of the vocal. Okay. I'm happy for you. I wish nothing but the best for you both. And you can tell she's right up on it. I love that. Is she perverted like me? I can hear a room in that. She goes on you in a theater. Does she speak Put the little echo in there. And would she have well, I can hear the room. Yeah. I'm sure she'd make a really excellent mother. Ever drive it a little bit there? Mm -hmm. Cause the love that you gave that we made wasn't able to make it enough for it sounds you like to they got be it. open wide. No. And so they got the reverb on both of yeah. them. Yeah. every time you speak her name, does she know how you told me you'd hold me until you died, till you died, but you're still alive and I'm here. To remind it away. You of the mess you now, left I don't, when you were I don't know whether that distortion would is there or whether it's from what transfers they did to the get this here. I just, like it. Yeah. 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 Squeaking a voice there. Yep. Seem very well. I mean you can hear the passion Things in her voice. Oh, it's amazing. Like girl who's just unbelievable. Peaceful. You know? There's a reason why this record I'm is so huge. Yeah, yeah, because you feel real. every moment of it. Yeah. I thought you should know. Did you forget about me? Because it's like if you ever hear any stems of John Lennon, reverb delays, all, <laughs> everything, and then you hear Paul McCartney, absolutely clean. There was a slap in the face. How quickly I was replaced. And I am thinking of me when you. Are. Ah, the radio version. Yeah. Wasn't able to make it for you to be and you know, the thing too is she was no. ready to say it. Yeah. You know? And, and say, it, spit it with such venom. You, you know? I'm died, glad I'm not whoever it is she's singing about. <laughs> and I'm A hockey player. Yeah. Yeah. To remind you of the mess you left when you went away. 
Yeah, yeah she definitely it's has a Canadian accent. To deny me all across side there that you gave to me. You, you, you ought to know. Yeah, she's like oh, it's amazing. out of breath when she's done. Yeah, and that's, that's a performance. That's a real performance. That is a performance. Um, unbelievable. You know, yeah. she was just firing this stuff out. Just get it down there. And well, Plus, sung as a pure double like that, there's also something about, you can tell me what, how you feel about this, but there's something about you do the rough comp and then you double against it and they work together. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like I like comping doubles because yeah. I hear things together that work together mm -hmm. as opposed to when you comp that like perfect take. Yeah. You know, you can't comp two perfect takes. No. It doesn't make no. any sense. No. And it you just need the interplay. Something has got to otherwise it's a double it's a it's a it's a duplicate. Yeah. And exactly. all if it's perfectly doubled, it's just a little louder. Yeah. You know. The only artist that I ever worked with who could double absolutely perfectly but still made it work was Donny Osmond. Donny mm. was unbelievable mm -hmm. but he could and it wasn't like you had this other vocal doing this you had this through the whole he would just just skew it just a tiny bit so it wasn't right exactly on top of it sure so you could feel it and it would like one take you know amazing <laughs> and this is when he was trying to break out of the donny osmond image you know sure. he was working with a couple of writers from new york uh, carl sturkin and evan rogers he said you know, somebody told me uh, I should probably get busted for drugs to help my image, you know, because he was like, he was Donny Osmond. He was so skinny. He goes, I'll never, I'll never escape it, yeah. you know. But what a, what a voice, man. Right. What a voice. He just was amazing. Absolutely Fantastic. amazing. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, that's, those are the kind of things that when you've got real talent in front of you, and to me, you know, real talent is not somebody who can just blow you away on their instrument. Real talent sure. is somebody that, can make you feel something. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is, that's what she does. She can make you feel it. Oh, no, it's unbelievable. Know? Yeah, yeah. the first time I heard this, and everything about this, and the video for this song was absolute genius yeah. because they're out in, like, the desert. It's, the, it's very video, not film. Yeah. So it's all kind of a little trashy, the way they filmed it. Mm -hmm. There's loads of, like, you don't really ever see her face. It's just the yeah. hair. Yeah. And the band are just going for it. And... I, it, it just made it even more intriguing. Yeah. Everything was right about this. I think there's a little bit of Alfred Hitchcock in there because Hitchcock used to say the scariest monster is the one you don't see. Sure. And the fact that you couldn't, is she, are they hiding her for some reason? Right. What? And they, yeah, it's like, okay, I want to know more about this. And, yep. and I think that that's a, something that's missing today. We know too much sure. about our artists. No, I you agree. Know? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I didn't know... Paul McCartney, that wasn't his real name. I didn't know his name was James McCartney until all these years later. It's like, no, you, now we've got... Well, it's quite a common thing in England where I grew up. Lots of people, you you call them by their middle name. Yeah. Well, this has been absolutely fantastic. This has been great. I've, yeah. I've, I've had a lot of fun, you know. I it's, really appreciate it. It's, well, thank Carlo for introducing us. Yes, it's it's interesting to, to sit down and, and, and go back over some of this stuff because, you know, for me, thank God for allmusic.com. Right. Because I've done a lot of projects... And it's, I forget, like, somebody called me not too long ago and said, hey, uh, congratulations, I see you got a cut on that Phil Collins record last year. I didn't do a Phil Collins record last year. Yeah, well, so it was a compilation. Happened? Well, it, he, Phil worked with us on Quincy's record. He sang a song called Do Nothing to You Hear From Me. Uh, well, he put that on his record. Oh, nice. So it shows up on on all music. But, uh, you know, as you open it up and you go, oh, yeah, I forgot I did that record. <laughs> well, it's just nice. You know? Now you're on a Phil Collins record. Yeah, yeah. No, we did. Uh, that was a long distance. He was in Halverson, Sweden, and we were in the capital. What and year we, was that? Uh, well, that would have been Quincy, so that would have probably been late 95, right. something like that. And I don't know, have you ever done any of those over Ednet things? It's the weirdest thing. You 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 close your eyes and they're coming out of the speakers. Yep. You have the studio. There's nobody out there. <laughs> yep. the I did it. I did it with uh, James Blunt a few years ago, and okay. he was in he was in Abbey Road. I was in Capital. Okay. And we did the ISDN. Now, obviously, they recorded the vocal. I told them how I wanted it to be. I okay. said 1073, 160, 1176, U 47. They did everything that way. The engineer obviously was incredible there, but I was directing him. Okay, so through the console, yeah. sitting yeah. in the studio, and we, and we were working. And exact, I know exactly what you mean. You're, he's in the vo he's in the vocal booth, and then when you say, "Okay, great, that was fantastic," you're like, "Oh, there's nobody to give there's a hug to." Yeah, yeah. Come on there's in, a, listen. Coming in. <laughs> oh, okay. You I'll just can't. get on a plane. Yeah, yeah. And I remember mm -hmm. also we did it 
like late morning, early afternoon, eight, eight, eight hours ahead. So yeah, they, it was yeah. like getting pretty late over yeah, there. Yeah, I, 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 I couldn't tell you what the time. I mean, we did it in the daytime here, so yeah. I'm not sure what it was. But it still had it the long, nine hours ahead. It was yeah. still a long delay. It was still, I think, about 138 milliseconds. Yeah. So you put the headphones on, and it was like, boink, 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 because you, you hear the, yeah. what he's hearing in the headphones, and then the delay coming out of the speakers. But it was still an interesting, because that's what it was. They were, they were recording there. Yeah, and Quincy was just sitting That's here talking we doing, to yeah. it, you know. Yeah, we did. Um, we did uh, 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 Phil from from Europe. We did Chaka Khan from London. We did Barry White from um, Boston. We did Gloria Estef Estefan from Miami. So we did all these long distance stuff. So it's it's interesting to have worked with somebody but never have been in the room with them, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, don't I you suppose they want, they together? just want the experience of having Quincy talk to them and, and yeah. mentor them through a vocal. So yeah. Yeah, and he was, he's, he's the most amazing producer I work with. And when I first started working with him, it were, there were times where it's like, he's not really doing anything. No, you know what he's doing? He's in the room. Right. You know what I mean? He's now, he's, he is the ultimate casting director because mm -hmm. he gets the guys that, I don't need to tell you what to do. I'm hiring you to do what you do. Here's the music. Because he has his core band, right? It's usually John Robinson, uh, um, Nathan East, Paul Jackson, and Greg Fillingates. That's usually his band. But every time I've worked with him, it's been three and one other guy. Like we did one thing where he had Vinny, and it's like, I wonder why JR is not here. And after the session, it was like, oh, okay, that's a Vinny part. You right. know what I mean? Right. So he didn't really have to do a lot because he knew the right people. He could Jerry Hayter write the arrangement. What, what more do you want? You know? Sure. And um, so, but the the way that he could inspire people you know sometimes he could inspire them by not being there we worked with a girl named tamia did a great job on this song but she was so nervous that uh, quincy i remember him telling rod temperton um have her come back tomorrow I won't, I won't be here and she came back the next day and killed it but i think she was just oh my god it's quincy and he said mm -hmm. look at her she's so tight right you know and he could you know he could feel that coming through the glass and that's 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 a great producer that's sure. a great producer. You know, he was, and, and his sayings are the greatest. Don't drive past the money is one of my favorite, you know. Right. And I was thought he's the, uh, the, the three most important things in music are the song, the song, and the song. The song, and the song. Yeah, everything <laughs> else is, you know, yeah. yeah, is window dressing for that, you know. So, yeah. You know. Marvelous. Well, thank yes, you ever so very much. Good. Thank you. I really it was appreciate great. it. And if, uh, any, any time come back, we have wonderful s facilities here. We will. Yeah. We'll come back and do a tour. Absolutely. So leave a bunch of comments and questions below. Maybe I'll throw you onto the bus and you can answer some. That's what the bus is for. There you go. Marvelous. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.